Welcome to Lost Mouth Baptist Church. Well, good morning. Again, it's my privilege this morning to welcome you all along here to this morning service. Welcome those of you that have gathered and those that are listening on YouTube and to those that will be listening later on in the week with the DVDs that are produced. So it really is here we've got rain. Eh? After yesterday, I think when we were coming home yesterday in the car, it was 27 degrees and here we've got rain. But hey, we have the sunshine, but boy, do we need rain. We also need rain. If we didn't have rain, we'd all live in a desert. And so therefore, it's good to see the rain. It's a blessing from God. We read in the Westminster Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. If you read Psalm 145, it basically says the whole of the psalm is saying the same thing. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So I trust that as we gather this morning and we sing the praises of God and recognize Jesus Christ once again for who He is, a Savior. Andrew mentioned in the prayer through the back this morning that He didn't come necessarily as a king. He came as a Savior that day. He came as a Savior. He was already a king. He came as a saviour. So, um, I'm going to read this morning from Psalm 111. Again, it's encouraging our hearts and our lives to praise God. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honourable and glorious and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will be ever mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. And, pray, and his praise endures forever. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Father, as we bow our heads as it were in your presence, Father, we come and we think of the words that we have just read. These words, Father, that encourage us, indeed challenge us to praise God for who he is. Father, as we read that psalm, we, we read the, the various descriptions that the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Father, and you showed your compassion towards each and every one of us, Father. You showed your compassion when the Lord Jesus came to this earth, Father. He came as a savior, Father, that he might save his people, Father. And so we praise you again this morning that you have declared to your people the power of your works. And Father, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to come to this place. We've been able to come here this morning in freedom, Father, to worship and to praise you and to lift up the name of Jesus. Father, help each one of us this morning to lift our eyes and focus upon Jesus, Father, the author and perfecter of our faith. Father, we love his name. There are many songs that describe that love. Father, that we love the name of Jesus and we come here this morning that we might extol his name, that we might, Father, recognize an awesome God. And so we praise you this morning, Father. And so we worship you. And so we ask, Father, that you would just be more than prepared, Father, to move in and amongst us this morning, touching hearts, touching lives again this morning. Father, help us 
to lift up your name this morning. Help us, Father, by your Holy Spirit to just praise and worship the Lord God Almighty, an awesome God. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now, the band is about to lead us in worship. Two songs. And the first one that Kenny has chosen, I think it's Kenny that chose the songs this week, is The King Has Come. And, and, and when I reflected on that even this morning, in verse 9 of Mark 11, that we're going, that's the, going to be the sermon for today, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we're going to sing, The King Has Come. And following the singing the sing of these two songs, Kate's going to come up and, and bring a, a, just something about, about the holiday club that's taking place later on. Let's all stand to sing. We're going to be playing along with tracks, so we'll have to be. <laughs> we'll see how it works out. The King of Love is my delight. His eyes are fire, his face is light. The first and last, the living one, his name is Jesus. And from his mouth there comes a sound that shakes the earth and splits the ground. And his voice is up to me, the voice of Jesus. I will sing my And he is mine How can a sin and no such joy Because of Jesus The wounds of love are in his hands The price is paid for sinful man Accepted child, forgiven son Because of Jesus And I will sing my songs of love Calling out across the earth, the King has come, the King of love has come. And troubled minds can know his peace, captive hearts can be released. The King has come, the King of love has come. A mighty desire, and my desire. Is to have you near, Lord, you know that you are welcome here. Before such love, before such grace, I will let the walls come down. And I will sing my songs of love, calling out across the earth. The King has come, the King of love has come. Yes, the King has come, the King of love has come. Who is there like you? This is one we haven't sung for a while, but it's a lovely song. suffering in my place. 
Morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to encourage the church, really, because um, over the last few weeks, you might have seen there's a a big castle appearing out the back, ready for holiday club. We're doing medieval mayhem, or it probably will be, uh, when we come to doing it. And I just want to encourage you that we've got um, 87 kids already signed up for it. So I just wanted to share that. I just thought it was great to share this encouraging news. So we are looking forward to it, but I am going to ask for some crafters to hopefully come forward and help. Now, it's just really for you to take away maybe a batch of 10 things to fold, cut, glue, stick. Pretty much that. Nothing really um, too elaborate in any way, shape or form. I've got to make... um, 50 cones out of black card and that actually challenges the primary one twos and threes just well actually challenges me to try and get it into a cone shape so if anybody is free to take away maybe a batch of bits of cards to do at home and then bring it back next sunday or the sunday after i would really greatly appreciate that things are starting to ramp up with wedding plans so um i've already had some random dreams already in the panic where i was going down the aisle Um, in my gardening clothes and no hair do. 
So this is what happens when I get anxious. I get weird dreams, and I've already been married once, so I don't want to do it again. Anyway, thank you very much. If you could spare some time to help out so that I can get ahead of the game, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I think as a fellowship, it's really important that at this time, the, the volume of work that Kate has on her hands just now, that we continue to remember Kate and, and our team, the folk that, that have volunteered to help and the folk that help every single week in the, in the children's work. It's really important. So, Kate, as a fellowship, we will promise to keep you in our prayers, particularly just now. It's a, there's a fearsome amount of work. I, I'm in here a few days a week, and, and you see the amount of work that, that Kate is actually putting in and the amount of talent that she's using. So, and it is a stressful time trying to prepare for holiday club and children's work and weddings. It's a stressful time. So the Lord bless you, Kate, and all that you do. The bulletin, it's a very busy bulletin this week, and we thank Hazel for producing the bulletin for us. It's a very busy bulletin, so I'm not going to go through it all. I just trust that you'll take the bulletin and that you'll read it. There are some points that we want to make from the bulletin. Um, you'll see that it's um, Molly Mill's funeral is going to be this Wednesday at Cato's funeral home in Elgin. So as a fellowship, we continue to remember uh, Molly's family at this time, continue to remember the family of Philip Wastony, Eunice, and, and I think some of them are, well, Davina's here that I can see, and her husband, but it's her fam some of her family are still with Eunice at this time, so remember them in our prayer. And obviously, um, Jimmy Donaldson's family, Maureen, and, and, and their family too. Um, The bulletin, the first of, oh, I write, Sea Fest is going ahead at a, at a reduced capacity this year, um, simply because they haven't been allocated the same volume of room down there for marquees and that is what they previously had. But we're still taking part in it, and so therefore we, we need some help. There will be sheets on the notice board for people to uh, put their names on to the various areas of help that are required is obviously the setting up of the marquee and tables, and we're not going to have a lot of chairs, so just some tables for the, for, to make things easier for them. Obviously, we'll need servers, and we're, Rachel Ruth's organising it, so if you can help in any way, put your name on the sheet or speak to Rachel Ruth. Um, we are going to try and take it into shorter blocks because we haven't got the same room for folks to sit down. Folk will be standing up, so we're going to try and and reduce the amount of time that each person. The more volunteers we get, the more we'll be able to give a break to the people that are going to be helping. We are obviously going to need some baking, and then we're going to not only need help to set up, we'll need help to take it down and take it back to the church. So if you can put your names and help out in that way. There is also a prayer... Um, Requests have come from uh, Madagascar, come from Madagascar, and she, she's, she's saying at this time she's going to Androf, Androi for two weeks and she's looking for prayer because she's traveling alone and things are quite difficult and she's asking that we'll pray for her, her health and also, she's grateful that it's going, she's going in June because it isn't too hot. And she's asking for us to keep other areas. So there is a prayer bulletin for you to pick up. It's on the desk there, just underneath the notice board. So if we can rem remember Deborah and her prayers at this time. She's a wonderful young lady, and for her age, she's so mature. She's been here several times, and it's really good that as a fellowship that we're able to to pray for her, it's a privilege to be able to pray for her, but obviously to, to share in our ministry, that's really what we're doing as a fellowship, we're sharing in our ministry, so read the bulletin for yourselves and pray through it, and remember Kate, and remember Deborah, and various other things, and let's come before God in prayer now.
Father, we thank you again this morning that you are an awesome God. We thank you, Father, that you're ever prepared to reach out and to help each and every one of us. Father, and there are those of us that need help in so many different ways, Father, that we come from different backgrounds, we come with different needs, but we know, Father, that you know each of our needs, Father. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so we're so grateful this morning that we can come to you as a fellowship, as a congregation, and we know that we can trust you. We know by faith, Father, that your grace is enough. And so we praise you this morning for just exactly who you are, Father. You're such a God, Father. You love us beyond our deserving. We could never earn that love. It's all of grace. And so, Father, this morning, as a congregation, we, we join our hearts in prayer, not only recognizing you for who you are, but recognizing, Father, that you're ever ready to help. And to that end, Father, we pray for our pastor this morning, Lord. We pray that as he comes up later on and shares your word, Lord, we again recognize it's a, an awesome responsibility to share the word of God and to do it faithfully. So if we just pray for Rob this morning, Father that you would anoint his ministry amongst us this morning, Father, that you would fill him to overflowing with a real sense of purpose as he shares your word this morning. And for us, Lord, we just pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to your word, open as he shares your word this morning. Father, help us to receive that word and to bury it, if you like, deep in our hearts that we might refer to that word, that we might be encouraged, that we might be challenged that we might even be rebuked, Father, but we just praise you and thank you for the word of God, that precious word. And Father, there are those of our fellowship that we want to remember before you at this time. We remember, Father, of the, the funeral that's to take place on Wednesday of Molly Milne, Lord. We thank you for Molly. We thank you for her life. We think, Father, of how she was still driving down here just a few months ago at 96 years old to share in fellowship with us, Lord. We remember her very fondly this morning, Lord, and we pray for the funeral service, Lord. We just pray for her family at this time. We just pray that all would go well, Lord. We think of those that have been recently bereaved. We think of Eunice and her family, Lord, and we just pray a real blessing upon them, Father. We thank you that some of them are still with Eunice, just supporting her at this time. So we just, we pray for them that you would just bless them, be near to them, Lord, in every way. And for Jimmy Donaldson's family, we think of Maureen and her family, Lord. And again, we thank you for them. We thank you for the roles that they play in this fellowship and have done over many years. So we just bring them before you and ask that you would just surround them with your love at this time. There are those others that are in need of our prayers. We think of Dolly. We think of the amazing recovery and we believe it's through the power of prayer, Lord. So we just pray that you would continue to bless Dolly. We think of Joyce Wilson at this time too, Lord. Um, who's been set aside with illness recently, Lord. So we pray for Joyce. Pray for Rachel Wilson, Father, who's home from hospital now and, and getting cared for by our family. Pray for Kate McKenzie. Lord, we thank you that she has been able to come out to a couple of things in the fellowship recently, Lord. And we just, again, think of how long she was in hospital from January till just recently, Lord. And he, yet she's able to get out and about a wee bit. So we just pray for her and for Dave as he continues to take care of, of her. We think of Peter and Leslie, Father, out there in, in Dora Hoy, Lord. Again, we bring them lovingly before you at this time. We thank you for the work that they undertake, for the service that they undertake in the name of Jesus, Lord. So we just pray a real blessing upon Peter and Leslie at this time. And now, Father, we just, as we... Just continue in your presence, Father. We just ask once again that you would just be with each and every one of us, Father. Help us, even as we lift our voices in praise and worship, as we spend time in prayer, and particularly, Father, as we come under the sound of your word. Lord, be with us. Just help us, Father. Strengthen us and lead us and direct us. In the name of Jesus, amen. The splendor of the King 
clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great. above all names. Let's give him all the honor and praise that's due his name. I give you all the honor and praise that to your name. For you are the King of glory, the Creator of all things. And I worship you. I give my life to you. I Spirit moves upon me now. You meet my deepest need, and I lift my hands up to your throne. 
Well, good morning. And we come to a, a, a significant section here as we're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. We come to chapter 11. And really, this is the, the entering into of Jesus' last week of his earthly ministry. We're coming to see, really, that he does something quite surprising if you've read through the rest of Mark, and you'll see that very often, and in, in particularly chapter 1, if you remember all the way back to chapter 1 when we began, there was a number of times when unclean spirits or a man who was healed from leprosy, leprosy wanted to tell everyone what Jesus had done, and he rebuked the unclean spirits not to speak, and he told the man, although he didn't listen, he told the man who'd been healed of leprosy not to say who he was, but just to go to the temple and be declared clean so that he could be included into society again. Of course, he didn't do that, and the crowds came, and he had to leave and go into the surrounding wilderness in order to teach all the crowds who came to hear from him. But this time, we're going to see this morning is quite different in the way that Jesus responds. He's going to make a declaration, really. He's going to embrace it, and not only is he going to embrace it, but he's going to be the, the one who puts the work in to make a declaration about who he is, and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning and considering for ourselves. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark 11. For those using the blue Bibles, it's page 847. And for anyone who's here doesn't have a Bible, please know that you can make this one yours. Well, not this specific one, that would be difficult for me, but the one that's around you, if there's a blue Bible, just pick it up, take it with you. We love people to have God's Word available to them. But let's read from Mark 11, beginning in verse 1 down to verse 11. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And when some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from their fields. 
And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Amen. God's word to us this morning. Let's pray as we come to this beautiful word. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise for all your goodness to us. We even think of what we've heard just today of those 87 children who have signed up to come into the holiday club, Lord, to learn all about you, to have a great fun during the summer, Lord. We just think of all your goodness and your blessings. And we think too of your word and how it is just a continuous revelation of who you are and that we can never dive so deep into your word that we ever exhaust the stream of your love and grace and depth of your knowledge that you desire to share with us. So, Heavenly Father, we come with that eager expectation. Give us a hunger in our hearts, a hunger in our minds to hear from you and to receive from you. And we do pray, Lord, that it be you that speaks to us. In your precious name we ask and pray. Amen. So I was saying, in in contrast to Jesus in the past, who had proactively kept people quietly, verse 12 tells us that when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, about two miles out of Jerusalem, uh, out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one's ever sat. Untie it and bring it, and if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has needs of it and will give it back immediately. Unlike John 6, when Jesus perceived the crowd would make him king by force and he actually slipped away after feeding the 5,000, now Jesus is getting the disciples ready and to help get things ready for this triumphant entry. It's a sign really that Jesus is, is ready to declare who he is publicly and in God's sovereign plan, it's going to confront the religious leaders who will respond by wanting to speed up their plans to have him killed before anyone else tries to coronate him. It's just worth recognizing how amazing Jesus' simple instructions are. He tells his disciples where they'll find a colt and what to do, and if anyone asks, what to say. And it's really just one more piece in what has been a whole gospel, and really a whole scripture, but particularly as we think about the gospel of Mark. Time and time again, Jesus has shown his power and his authority and his commitment. And once again, he does it here with a divine knowledge, showing that he is God and God knows everything. Jesus is able to picture it all the way. You walk into the village, he says, and you'll see a colt and you'll see a young donkey. It's never been ridden. And essentially, I just want you to help yourself to this colt and walk away with it. And if anyone asks you about it, tell them that the Lord needs it and that you'll bring it back or send it back immediately. And so the disciples go, and that's exactly as Jesus tells them. They completely trust him and go into this situation. So verse 4 tells us that they went and found a colt tied on the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of them around, rightly good neighbors, uh, turned around and says, what are you doing untying that colt? And he told them what Jesus said, and they let them go. Jesus was well aware that someone was going to challenge these two disciples, Luke, in his account, actually, of the same event, tells us that the owners were within the group standing there. And Jesus, in his divine knowledge, knew that this answer would be enough. They were essentially asking the disciples, what are you doing just taking a colt without ever asking? I wonder if they walked in and they maybe said to each other, there's a colt tied up. We'll just have this one and pull it off. This must be the one Jesus was talking about. And they begin to, to walk off. And I'll tell you now, If ever I saw my car driving down the street and someone that I didn't know was inside it and I went up and I would maybe knock the window and say, this is my car. What are you doing in it? And the driver turns and says, don't worry about it. The Lord needs it and he'll bring it back immediately. My response would be something like, well, I'll save you some time and you can just bring it back right now. Get out of my car and run and jump. That's what normal people say in situations when you just go into a village, you take a colt and you begin to walk off with the colt, and yet Jesus knew that being able to turn around and say, do you know what, the Lord has need of it, and it'll come back to you immediately. He doesn't say, we'll bring it back. He says, we'll send it back to you immediately. 
And it's enough for these people. We don't know anything about their situation, whether it was a response of faith, whether they'd had a, a dream to make them think, actually, if this happens, or, or whether it was just the fact that, well, if the Lord needs it, I don't want to get in the way of this. Whatever it was, Jesus knew, this is what you'll say to them. And the minute Jesus said, well, they say what Jesus tells them to say, they let them go. The owners actually let them go with this cult. Then we see why the colt was needed in verse 7. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and they sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they'd cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. The reason why this had to happen was because Jesus was actually fulfilling a prophecy that he did. Now, if you've got the Blue Bibles at page 797, you'll find Zechariah 9.9. And if you use the front of your book, you can pretty much find uh, the books of the Bible if you need to. It's right towards the end of the Old Testament. But well worth uh, the time of looking up. In Zechariah 9.9, A prophecy from Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Every Jew would have known this prophecy, and there was at the particular time of Jesus a particularly strong emphasis on the Messiah. That strong emphasis for the Messiah came up because they were tired of Roman occupation. There was such a heat about it, and more and more people were teaching, do you know, a time is going to come when the Messiah comes, and he'll put all these things right. And so they, they saw when Jesus was riding in on this colt, the fulfillment of, Jer of Zechariah 9 Nine. They saw for themselves this idea that the, the rule of Israel uh, over the Roman occupation was coming to an end and he was going to establish his rule. And Jesus sparks the response he does from the crowd because he's basically declaring in this action that he is indeed God's anointed one. And he begins to head towards Jerusalem where surely they were expecting something radical to happen when he arrives. As Zechariah prophesied about him, he is the king. He is righteous. He has salvation. And Zechariah says he is humble. We see that humility in him when he arrives here, not on a horse in power like a king, but as prophesied on a donkey in peace and humility with these cloaks thrown on the ground. The crowd respond to Jesus' declaration with their own praise, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And Hosanna really means save now, and it's really a word that's pleading in nature. Whether they fully understood it or not, they were pleading with Jesus to save them right now. And they spoke of this coming kingdom of our father David. As I've already mentioned, they were expecting Jesus to save them by saving them from the Romans to bring about this coming kingdom, which was a kingdom just like their father David, King David, the greatest king Israel ever had, who ruled Israel in a time of great strength and wealth and eventually handed over the kingdom to his son Solomon in peace. I was thinking this might be inappropriate, but I don't think it is, but uh, I was thinking that if they had a little phrase they might have used, I think it would have been, make Israel great again. That would have been what the, the Israel people were saying. They were harking back, which is what that phrase is trying to do, hark back to a time of the glory years. And they had this idea that the Messiah was going to come and give us back everything again and, and make Israel great again. That's what they're pleading out for. They just wanted it. They wanted their pride restored. They wanted their status restored. They wanted their strength restored. But what actually happens instead is quite anticlimactic, isn't it? 
Verse 11 tells us, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And you kind of pause at this minute because you think, right, this is it. He's arrived. Something dramatic's going to happen as he arrives in Jerusalem. And he went into the temple and he had a look around at everything. And as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He arrived in Jerusalem, he goes to the temple and then he, he looked around and he went, great, see you tomorrow. And off he went. He rode in, fulfilling Jer- Zechariah 9.9 and people are, are shouting, Hosanna, save us, save us now, immediately pleading, please save us now. And, he, and then he arrives and then he, and then he leaves. And it feels so anticlimactic as you read it. There's no great uprising. The Romans watch on unharmed. And as Jesus leaves, nothing seems to have changed with the declaration of Zechariah fulfilled. Jesus' time has come, but it's not the moment when he arrives in Jerusalem under the triumph of the crowd. It's going to be in a few more days when he arrives under the hatred of the crowds, where instead of shouting, Hosanna, they're going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. It's an incredible moment. But there's a few things as we unpack this and consider it further that I want us to think about. The first is a point I saw everywhere else, elsewhere, so I was reading on this passage, and I think it's really true today. The coronation a few months ago was my first coronation, at least the first uh, coronation in the United Kingdom or Great Britain or whatever we call ourselves under coronations. And I'd imagine for most of us it was our first coronation, but I know there's a few of us who saw Elizabeth II being coronated as well. During the coronation, there was a lot of attention on people who wanted to make the point that Charles III was not my king. You'd have seen the signs being put up. There was a lot of tension about whether they get arrested or whether they could move them on. They wanted to reject Charles III as their king. And in doing so, I think they were trying to reject the whole idea of a king full stop. It's an interesting reaction. It was an interesting way where people wanted to say, this king has got nothing to do with me. You can have your king, they were essentially saying. You want a king, you can have a king. Uh, you know, but we don't want a king. We want nothing to do with the idea of a king. And I think there's many people today who feel the same way about Jesus, that he is not my king. And what we see Jesus declaring is that, in fact, he is king. He isn't king because archbishops made him and recognized his calling to be king. He is king because he's fulfilled Zechariah. And in doing so, he is declaring, I am the king that God prophesied would come and I come in the authority of God. And in our society, just the the way we approach these things, we live more and more in a day where faith is viewed as a personal choice. It's a private affair. And it's this kind of idea that, you know, if you want to make Jesus your king, that's absolutely fine, you can do that, but Jesus isn't my king, so don't impose your views on me, don't talk to me about Jesus as king, Really, to be honest, it's a private thing that should stay within your household. And when you come out of the house, you should kind of be quiet about it. In some ways, you see it in the most extreme. When I was at university, there was a lecturer who kind of said, look, we're doing this academic stuff, okay? We're grown-ups now. So when you come into my classroom, leave your faith at the door. I said to him, listen, I can't leave my faith at the door. It's not something I can just park in my rucksack at the back and then pick it back up on my way out. My faith is my life. My faith is everything. And furthermore than that, there's a reality here that Jesus is king whether you recognize him or not. See, Jesus hasn't become king when we let him become king. Jesus is king. Jesus doesn't say, if it's okay with you, I'd like to be Lord of your life. Jesus is Lord. The reality is that that in our society, we live in a society that really says, do you know, you might have a king in Jesus, but I don't want to hear anything about it. But the response and the Christian response is, whether you listen to it or not, it's true. So at best, all you can be offered is ignorance. It's not something that you enter into. It's something that exists right now. It's not something that you can choose. He is. The only choice you have is how you respond to Jesus as king. Now, we can ignore Charles III as being our king. And in many ways in this country, we can get away with that. But he's still king in Scotland and England and Northern Ireland and the Commonwealth and wherever else. 
wheel. He's still king. And even more so, if, if kings of the earth are down here, Jesus is up here. In fact, he's further up here. Jesus is the king. And the moment he rides in on this colt, he's declaring to the people, here I am, like in Isaiah at the beginning, when he reads from the, the scroll in Isaiah, and he says, these words have been fulfilled in your standing. He's on this colt saying, look, I am the king who has come. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Whatever today's kings look like, Jesus is a proper king, which means he rules. And as a ruler, everyone will one day stand before him in the judgment seat of Christ. And we won't be able to say, you're not my king. He'll say, I am king. And you will stand before me. So Jesus is king. We don't have an option in that. We might want to say that, that, that Jesus is good for you, but it's got nothing to do with me. No such thing exists. But what we also want to look and see that authority of God is to recognize not only can we have no chance of overthrowing his throne because he's God, but the second thing we want to see is the kind of king he came to be. You know, when, when a king came in and took over, normally through killing the previous king and, and taking the throne, you'd always say to yourself, I wonder what kind of king has arrived. And the first things that those kings would do would indicate if he's going to be a kind king and a gracious king or a harsh king. And these words point beautifully in Zechariah to the kind of king who has come. Jesus is the kind of king who has brought salvation. And he brings a salvation in humility. If they look close enough, they'd see that Jesus didn't come to throw out the Romans, but to bring them back to his heavenly Father. He knew he could judge them there and then. He had every right to do so, but he chose to, became, to become salvation. One day, he will stand as judge, but not this time. Jesus didn't come into Jerusalem as the king to judge Jerusalem, although we'll see next week in some of the judgments that he makes in his authority as king. But for now, what we see is Jesus coming in humility, not to conquer, but to be the sacrificial lamb, to offer salvation by taking on our sin and experiencing our death with that separation from God the Father that we deserve so that we'll never experience, because of our sin, that rejection of him, and we can have him as king of our lives. Jesus is the most powerful king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet he chooses to use his power to create a kingdom, not based on Jewish pride at making Israel great again, but a king who creates a kingdom that offers salvation for all eternity at total cost himself. It's a kingdom like no other. And it's not the kingdom that the people shouting Hosanna wanted, but it's the kingdom that the people shouting Hosanna needed. And Jesus came to make the impossible possible by dealing with our sin, that we might have a king who makes us royalty in his name. And at his cost, through his suffering in our place. The reality of this king, I didn't think I was going to have time, but I actually have loads of time. So in 1 Samuel Eight, I think it is. It is 1 Samuel 8. There's a moment where the people of the elders of Israel see that Samuel's sons don't walk in the way of the Lord and they come and they ask for a king. And they want a king because they want to be like all the other nations. And in the evening service, we went through first, the first part of 1 Samuel. We'll come back to it eh, probably when we finish James. But we did this and we covered this section at the time. And when they came to ask for a king, Samuel goes and, and speaks as a prophet, goes and speaks to God. And God says, you know what, Samuel? They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me because I'm the king over Israel and they're rejecting me as king. But he says, if that's what they want, give it to the people, but go and speak to them. And he says in the beginning of 1 Samuel 8, I heard some pages turn. So for those turn to it, it's first um, five, kind of B, five, halfway through B. Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. And I appoint to as a king to judge over all the nations. This thing displeased Samuel that they said, give us a king to judge us. 
And as Samuel prayed to the Lord, the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice of the people and all they say for you, for they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from becoming king over them. And then he goes on to say and explain what it will look like And so in verse 10, Samuel told the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, there will always be ways of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to his horsemen and to run before the chariots. And he'll appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. And some he'll make plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He'll take a tenth of your grain and all your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He'll take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and he'll put them to work. And he'll take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And on that day, you'll cry out because of your king whom you've chosen for yourselves. But the Lord won't answer you in that day. And we're told that the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. That's a picture of every king ever in the world. A king who is taken for himself because he's king. A king who has grown in his own power and ability. That's what a kingdom looks like. And then we see Jesus come along and we see what kind of king he is. And instead of taking from us, he gives himself for us. Instead of coming to take the best interest for himself, the best land for himself, the best people to work for him, instead he becomes a humble servant. And he goes to the cross so that he can be the king of a kingdom that you and I can be part of. Because without his death, we would never be able to join his kingdom. He becomes a king who has no need for anything. What good is gold to him who made gold? What good is even our worship when in heaven he's worshiped continually? Yet he gave up the comfort of heaven to come to earth. To listen to the crowd, not just shout Hosanna, but then shout crucify him. In order to give himself for you and for me. As we're confronted by that king, whether we recognize him or not, He is king. But as we come to recognize him as king, and we can receive that inheritance of his kingdom, brought back into relationship with him as our heavenly father, the final question I really want to ask is, is he your king? Now, I don't just mean have you come to faith, but that's a really important question. Have you ever actually repented of the wrongs you've done in your life, recognized that separates you from God and his holiness? said sorry, accepting that Jesus' death is enough to receive forgiveness and then live for him. If you haven't, then that's a fundamental call of the Christian faith. To trust the fact that that Jesus' death is enough to bring us back into relationship with him. To repent of the cause of our sin, our bad things that caused Jesus to die on the cross. And to receive not only his forgiveness, but to promise, right, Lord, from this point forward, I want to live my life for you. But more than this, I'm asking, is Jesus your king? That's really the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning. Is Jesus king in our lives? If we look at all that it's cost Jesus to make us royalty, are we willing to make him king over our lives? Jesus who doesn't come and take the best of our lands. Jesus who come and doesn't say, I'm going to gain from you, but came instead to give to us. But he does say, I am the king. Obey me. I am the king. Trust me. I am the king. Follow me wherever I go. And the fundamental truth of the Christian faith is a battle, isn't it? And if you don't think it's a battle, then probably is Jesus really king over your life? Because the most mature of us who follow after Jesus do so in the maturity that we are constantly having to make him king in our lives. Right from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, there was a temptation. Did God really say that to you? If you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. You can be king over your own life instead of under God's rule. 
And Adam and Eve looked at the fruit and they thought, that looks tasty to me. And every single day since, we've had a battle going on for the authority of Jesus when we've said, you know what? That looks tasty to me. And so as Jesus declares that he is king riding into Jerusalem on that colt, the question is, is he king of your life? Is he king of your life? And if he's king of your life, then you look at the cost of Jesus on the cross and you say, Jesus, I recognize that you have given more than I can ever repay. But in worship to you, I'm not just gonna sing songs in sung worship. I'm not just gonna come and praise you through prayer and reading of the word. But as we'll even see tonight, we're gonna live lives that submit to him and recognize that he is king. And although he's a generous king, just like in 1 Samuel 8, we see that a king has authority. So, uh, Solomon, when he would become king, he would take the best lands and because he was king, he'd have to be given them. Because he was king, he would take your sons and daughters and put the sons into the army and turn the daughters into working for the perfumers or the cooks or the bakers or as perfumers and cooks and bakers. And all you could say is, well, you're the king, okay. And when Jesus comes and says, come and follow me, pick up your cross, they say, well, you're king, okay. Not only would we say, your king, okay, and bow down to him and recognize his place, but we can also look at the cross and we can see that God's reigning and ruling is a generous reigning and ruling. I want to say that last. I want to say that second. Because the first thing I want to say is Jesus reigns and he needs to reign in our life. And the second thing I would then say is Jesus reigning in your life is the best life you can live. But I don't want to say it the other way around. Because in that moment when people were praising that Jesus is king, what they were really saying is, here comes the king who's going to do my bidding. He's going to remove the Romans from occupying in Israel. He's going to put the pride back into Israel. He means that he'll make Israel great again and I can look with courage, look with pride, and we're back at the strength of Israel and glorified once again in the world. That's what they were hoping that Jesus was coming to do. What they needed to say is, Jesus, we can recognize you are king. You have healed. You've spoken words of truth. And you're now riding in on a colt, fulfilling this prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. You are definitely king. What would you like me to do? We bow before you as king over us. And what we discover when we do that with Jesus is he doesn't turn around and say, well, I'd like your car. I'll bring it back to you at some point. He doesn't say, I want the best of your bank balance. He doesn't say, I want all your land and your sons and your daughters. He turns around, okay, I'll give you life and life in all its fullness. Okay, I'll give you purpose. Okay, I'll help you find your meaning as Chris was reminding us to worship God and enjoy him forever is the chief end of man. There's nowhere better to be than as a servant of King Jesus. There's nowhere safer to be than the servant of King Jesus. We know through the cross and resurrection that our future is secured in him through faith. But not only that, we live lives now that is glorifying to him and in being glorifying to him, it's fruitful, it is fulfilling, and it's purposeful. But to get to that point, we have to get down on our knees and say, Jesus, we recognize you as king of our lives. And every time something comes in our life that looks good to the eye, that looks attractive to us, we have to say, no, thank you, Jesus is Lord. And every time our heart says to us, do you know what? You'd be so much happier if you just had this. And we look at God's scripture, which is for, and written to us in love, and we say, actually, that is contrary to what God wants for our lives. We say, no, thank you, Jesus is king. And the older we get in Christianity, and I'm still pretty young, 
the more we realize that that is a battle we have to constantly bring before the Lord. That continually our hearts want to say, don't forgive that person. They don't deserve it. Jesus comes in kings and says, yeah, they don't deserve it, but neither did you. And we come and say, we don't want to be generous about that because we've worked really hard to build up that kind of comfort. And Jesus says, I gave up comfort for you. Jesus is king. It's a difficult reality of life. It's easy, isn't it, to be in the moment with a crowd and shouting Hosanna. It was totally different a week later when the disciples were hiding and just some faithful women were there who recognized Jesus as king. Jesus is king. Will you bow before him? Jesus is king, will you trust him? And Jesus is king, will you discover life in all its beauty is discovered in submission to him? Let's pray together. Our Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do not make you king, that it is not a coronation that we can take part on that makes you king, but you are king. You have always been king. And Lord, you have become king of kings and lord of lords in the most amazing way by giving your life on the cross for us. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you as our king, not only with our lives, but also trust you with our salvation. That we would recognize that when you promised our sins would be forgiven, that we would trust that to be true. That, Lord, you would bring us back into that deep relationship with your heavenly Father who becomes our heavenly Father. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage and the strength to make you king of our lives. Lord, help us not to be ignorant. Reveal the areas of our lives to us where we do not make you king over it, Lord. We recognize that the greatest challenge of the church so often is just letting you have your place amongst us, knowing that everything else will be added unto us afterwards if we just seek your kingdom first. Lord, we ask that by your spirit, you would help us to see it so that we can in every way submit to you, knowing that it would be for our betterment and for your glory. In your precious name we pray, amen. So stand to sing. You are my king, amazing love. Forsaken. I'm accepted. You are condemned. I'm alive and well. Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? To my king would die. joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my King. You you are my king. Amazing.
Should we come to the close of our service on the scripture reading? You're invited to stay for tea and coffee. Please do stick around. But let's read these words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. You have been listening to Lossiemouth Baptist Church. For more information, look at www.lossiebaptist.org. Thank you.